Asian style bread has clear differences from other kinds of bread in general. It's generally soft, fluffy, and flavorful in a rich way. In this video, we wanted to delve into making a soft and fluffy Asian style bread with Tang Chong. This recipe makes two lovely loaves. We'll be baking one in a glass loaf pan and one with a closed Pullman loaf pan. We'll be going from the detailed explanations of the ingredients to the methods. So let's jump straight in. So we'll start out with preparing the ingredients. First off, we're going to make some tang zhong. Now, for more detailed steps and explanations on the benefits, please check out our other video on tang zhong. For this video, I'll keep it short and just say the benefits of tang zhong are to make the bread softer and stay that way for longer. The process of making it is pretty quick and simple. We'll be using 30 grams of flour in a small pan and mixing it into 150 grams of water. Then after combining it homogeneously and making it free of lumps, we're going to set the mixture atop a stove. Whilst continuously mixing it, we're going to heat it until it reaches 60 to 65 degrees Celsius. Once we become thick and smooth like this, then it's ready. So we can put it into a bowl to cool, covering it with plastic, making sure it touches it, to prevent it from forming a skin. Once it cools down, it's ready to use. Then we're going to begin making the main dough. So in a large mixing bowl, we're going to add in 520 grams of bread flour, Quick explanation on this, so different types of flour have different amounts of protein. Bread flour has one of the highest amounts of very high protein content. And these proteins in the flour are the building blocks of gluten. So with more protein content, the more gluten is formed in general. Since the gluten network of the dough is what makes it strong and elastic, the more gluten we have, the stronger the dough. A strong dough is better capable of keeping its shape and trapping in the bubbles produced by the yeast allowing it to rise up and become fluffy and airy. These are the benefits of making the dough stronger, which is why we use this bread flour to strengthen our dough. To be exact, our flour's protein content is about 13%. And after the flour is in, we add 40 grams of milk powder. Since milk is mainly water, using milk powder, we can get all the benefits of milk without having to add that much water. Milk is a common ingredient in softer breads like Asian style ones. This is because milk really does suit these breads. It improves the taste of the bread. It also makes the crust color of the bread a little darker due to the lactose it has inside of it. And it additionally contains a bit of fat, just a bit, which will tenderize the bread. After the milk powder is in, we're going to add in 90 grams of sugar and after that, 2 teaspoons or 10 grams of salt. Note that in this recipe, we use unsalted butter later, so we have full control over the salt content. If you're using salted butter, you may want to lower the amount of salt here. Salt is frequently found in lean doughs, while sugar is commonly omitted. They both act in different ways on the dough. Salt is a flavor enhancer, everything tastes dull without it, and it also tightens the gluten structure of the bread dough, strengthening it. Sugar is also a flavor enhancer, but it has a very different effect on the dough than salt. Since sugar binds to water, it competes with gluten for water, which ends up weakening the gluten structure. This leads to the bread being much softer, and sugar also holds moisture, so it keeps the bread softer for longer, like tang chong. After sugar and salt, we're going to add in the most hard-working ingredient, one and a half of a teaspoon of yeast, or six grams. This is a slightly larger than average amount of yeast because we have quite a bit of sugar in this recipe. While the yeast can eat the sugar, they can only handle so much. More sugar than they can handle will stall their growth, making the fermentation time longer. The amount of sugar we add is above the threshold, 16%, so we add a bit more yeast to compensate for the slowing. With the yeast, we're done adding the dry ingredients, and we're going to add in the wet ingredients next. So grab one whole egg and we'll crack it into a separate bowl to prevent eggshells from getting into the dough. Then we pour it into the dough. Eggs are a key ingredient in a lot of enriched bread recipes and Asian style ones too. It's because they serve a lot of purposes, both the egg white and the egg yolk. The egg yolk contains tenderizing fat, which we'll see more of in another ingredient later, and it also contains emulsifiers. Since emulsifiers help combine ingredients, they stabilize the bread dough further, which is very useful in Asian-style bread recipes because the bread dough is made up of many ingredients that don't necessarily mix well. As for egg whites, although they're mainly made of water, they also help to strengthen the bread dough since they contain a lot of proteins. After the egg, we want to add 160 grams of water. 
Water is what'll bring everything together. The water we're using here is cold water. Got some ice because the weather here is quite warm and the dough will become even warmer when we mix it in the stand mixer later. If you live in a colder climate, you may want to use room temperature water or even lukewarm water instead. It's just all about getting the right temperature for the yeast in the dough, really. Once we've poured all the water in, we want to add the penultimate ingredient, our prepared tang zhong. Tang zhong works based off of the principle of gelatinized starch. When we heat it up flour and water in the pan, we cause the starch in the water to swell up and absorb more water. When we add this to the dough and mix it in, it's going to spread the gelatinized starch throughout, which is going to keep the dough fresh for longer due to the extra water it stores. Again, for more on this, do check out our other video where we go much more in depth on it. Okay, then we're going to take out the last ingredient, 55 grams of butter. We're taking it out of the fridge now so it can soften for a little bit so that it combines more easily, but we're going to add it later after mixing the bread dough for a while. And the reason we're going to do that is so we can allow some of that gluten structure of the bread to form first. Butter, like any fat, has the ability to weaken the gluten network by coating the proteins from the flour and preventing them from connecting to form gluten. If you've ever smeared your hands in butter and experienced the slippery feeling of trying to pick something up, then you probably know how the proteins trying to link together feel. So we're going to put this bowl into the stand mixer with a dough hook attachment first. We strongly recommend the use of a stand mixer for this recipe because the dough contains fat and sugar. These ingredients weaken gluten as mentioned, so there will be some intensive kneading needed to develop the gluten. All right then, with the bowl in, we'll mix on low for a few minutes to allow it to form a shaggy dough so we don't get flour flying everywhere. Then we'll take the speed up to medium and let it run for about five minutes, depending on the mixer's speed and power. During this time, it's going to steadily come together, develop a fair amount of gluten. All's going well. Once it looks like this, a cohesive dough, it's already formed enough gluten and we'll add in the butter. Add 55 grams of unsalted butter straight in. The butter shouldn't be too cold, it should be softened. Then we're gonna turn the mixer back on and finish fully kneading it. We'll put the speed on medium and the entire process should take about another 10 to 15 minutes. At first, the butter will slide around and the dough will look like it's coming apart, but eventually the dough will come back together and it'll become an even smoother lump of dough than before. Don't be too worried if it looks very sticky. The dough takes a few minutes to fully develop the gluten, and in the last minutes, it'll eventually clean the bowl a little and look much more cohesive. That's when it's done. So the 15 minutes are up, we switch off the mixer, and the dough is ready for the next step. So we'll oil down a large glass bowl with our hands and some oil. Well, it doesn't have to be a glass bowl, we just like it because we can see the dough rising. It does need to be large though, because the dough will expand during bulk fermentation. Once the bowl and our hands are well oiled, we're gonna do the window pane test on the dough, which is just as shown. We'll pick up a small part of the dough and see if it can be spread thin enough to see light through it, which this one can, and that is a sign of full gluten development. Just means the dough is fully kneaded and ready to go. Grab our scraper and we're gonna move the dough from the mixing bowl to the glass bowl. This is where our oiled hands come in handy as the dough doesn't stick to them. Coat the dough in the oil and we're also just gonna shape it into an even round shape. Then we'll cover it and leave it to bulk ferment for one to one and a half hours. We want it to double in size and the time that takes will depend on your local climate. So a quick tip that we really like to tell what the dough should look like when it's doubled in size is to push up the dough to the midline of the bowl. The height that the dough reaches should be the height of the dough when it doubles in size. During this time, the yeast will be eating away at the sugars in the dough, releasing gas as a byproduct. This gas will be trapped by our dough's gluten network, causing it to rise up. When it's done with bulk fermentation, we're gonna move on. Lightly flour the work surface, then we flip the dough over onto it, just letting it come out. This is where the importance of oiling the bowl well should be apparent. The dough should slide right out. Next, use as much flour as necessary to manage the dough and prevent it from sticking to your hands and the surface. Then we'll firmly deflate the dough to get rid of the larger air pockets. This will cause the larger pockets to rupture and then reform into smaller ones, which gives us that dense crumb with smaller bubbles throughout. 
As we've gotten rid of most of the gas now, we can shape it back into a round boule and continue to the next step, dividing the dough. We want to divide the dough into five pieces. Since we'll be using two loaf pans to bake two loaves, one glass pan and one Pullman loaf pan, we're going to use two pieces of dough, each weighing about 300 grams for the Pullman loaf pan, so they'll go into there. Then the remaining three pieces will go into the glass pan, with each weighing somewhere around 160 grams. It's perfectly fine to be a bit inaccurate, since the bread will taste good regardless of its size. If there are any large pockets, be sure to pop them. We don't want any gaping holes in our milk loaf. Then, after we have them all well divided, we're going to pre-shape the bread into round boules. This is just so that they're even and easier to shape later. So we take a piece of the dough and bring in the edges to form a rough ball. Then we're going to roll it until it becomes smoother and rounder. Okay. After it's done, put it down, seam side down and smooth side up then repeat for the remaining pieces of dough. If you live in a drier climate, you may have to work more quickly to prevent the dough from drying out. It's quite humid here, so we don't need to worry about that. When all the dough has been pre-shaped, we're gonna cover them and then leave them for 15 minutes. This is a bench rest so that the dough can rest. It relaxes the gluten, which will make it much easier for us to shape it later. While the dough is resting, we'll just quickly prepare for the final shaping. We're going to prepare the bread's baking pans by smearing it with some butter. Well, as much butter as needed, actually. We want to do this generously so that the bread is easy to take out of the pan. Just smear it all over. As mentioned, the bread dough makes two loaves using these two loaf pans. Loaf pans are great for lightly enriched bread doughs like this because they help the bread maintain their shape and rise upwards. This bread dough is weaker than, say, most artisan lean doughs, so the extra support from the pan is very useful. All right, then once the 15 minute break is over for the bread, we're gonna shape these dough balls. Okay, so get it ready. Using as much flour as necessary to prevent the dough from sticking again, we dust the surface a little, and then we take one of the dough pieces, flip it over, smooth side down. Taking a rolling pin, we're gonna flatten it into a long oval. We found the best way to do this is roll from the center, keep rolling until the end, and then just repeat until it's long enough. Doing this a few times just to get it nice and flat. Then we'll fold it into a neat little rectangle, just by bringing in the top and the bottom. Then we're gonna flatten this out using the rolling pin again, all the way out. Once it's completely flat, we're gonna roll it back up into a swirl, just like this. And then we're done with shaping it. We're gonna put it aside for a moment. Then we're gonna do the same shaping for the remaining pieces of dough. As we finish shaping the pieces, two rolls of dough go into the Pullman loaf pan, seam side down, of course. This is something that we'll apply in general, by the way. We want the swirls of the dough to be rotating in opposite directions to each other. This is meant to help the dough push up further while baking, so something like this. After they're both in, we'll press them flat with one hand. This is to ensure they're all settled and will help them rise evenly in the oven. Cover the pan, and then we shape the remaining three dough pieces. Line them up on the side, and then we put them into the loaf pan, again, seam side down, and maintaining that each swirl rotates in the opposite direction to the other. And when they're all in, we press down to maintain their evenness, again. Cover that as well to prevent them from drying, and we're done shaping them. It's time to leave them for the final proof. We're going to leave them for one hour. We want them to double in size again. This should mean they nearly reach the line of the loaf pan. While the bread proofs, we're going to get the oven ready by preheating it to 170 degrees Celsius. For baking this Asian style bread, we'll use a much lower temperature than if we were baking artisan bread. This is because this bread recipe, due to its sugar in part, browns much more quickly in the oven. So we bake at lower temperatures to properly heat up the insides without burning the outer crumb. Then when the time's up, we're going to get the loaves ready for the oven with just one more final touch. We're gonna brush the dough with an egg wash. So to prepare it is very simple. Crack an egg in a small bowl, then beat it well. There, the egg wash is ready to be brushed onto the bread. 
We're making sure to brush the egg wash onto the dough gently though, otherwise we'd risk accidentally degassing the dough. Some people prefer to dilute the egg wash a little with water or milk, since milk will make the crust color a bit darker, but we like pure egg wash the best because we already have milk in the bread and the golden sheen egg wash provides is already very nice. Don't need to brush on too much egg wash though, since that could actually get in between the bread and the baking pan, causing it to stick despite our efforts with the butter. So we're just aiming for a light coating of the top of the dough. We're also going to give it a sprinkling of sesame seeds as a topping. It's just an optional step to make the bread look and taste a little better. Now that that's all done, we can put the dough in the oven, middle rack, top and bottom heat at 170 degrees Celsius. We're gonna bake for 30 to 35 minutes or until the bread turns golden brown. Now, if you see the bread browning too quickly to the point where the top of the bread looks like it might end up burnt before the bread finished baking, then a tip is to put a layer of baking paper over it that's going to stop the top from burning and allow for more even coloration. When it's done, we're gonna take the pans out of the oven, letting it cool for a while before we get the bread out. You may need a spatula to loosen some corners that stuck, but as long as the pan was buttered properly, it should eventually come out. We're gonna put it on a wire rag to cool to prevent the bread from having a soggy bottom crust. And the bread is ready to be eaten. This bread is best eaten fresh or on the same day as it was made. And that's it for the video today. Thanks for watching and bye. I'm going to go eat my bread.